Today, what we're going to do is really, it's a really short a new series that I want to take us through. It's a, just two weeks, and it's based on an outline from a pastor and leader, John Maxwell. Uh, he wrote a, a book many years ago called Winning with People. Great book. If you've not read it, I would recommend you grab it and, and have a read. And it's a place, and in, this, and in this book, Maxwell encouraged us, us to start with a thought that um, we all want to get along with someone else. We, we all do. There is someone that we, we want to get along with, no matter what. But for those of us who believe in God, it's pretty critical that we get along with others. That's kind of central to the whole idea of being a Christian. Uh, after all, what we're told in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter uh, 5, uh, verse, uh, verse, uh, beginning in verse 5, or verse 19 in chapter 5, we read these words, uh, that God uh, was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against him. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. It was this guy's first day on the job. And he was a new clerk in the green goods department of a supermarket. And a lady came up to him and she said that she wanted to buy half of a head of lettuce. He tried to dissuade her from that goal, but she persisted. Finally, he said, I'm going to have to go to the back and talk to my manager. He went to the rear of the store to talk to the manager, not noticing that the woman was walking right behind him. When he got to the back of the store, he said to the manager, yeah, there's some stupid old bag out there that wants to buy half a bag of lettuce. What should I tell her? Seeing the horrified look on the face of the manager, he turned around and seeing the woman added, and this nice lady wants to buy the other half of the head of lettuce. Will that be okay? Considerably relieved, the manager said, that, that'll be fine. Later in the day, he congratulated the young man on his quick thinking. He then asked him, he said, where are you from? The boy said, I'm from Toronto, Canada, the home of beautiful hockey players and ugly women. The manager looked at him and said, my wife's from Toronto. The boy said, oh, what team did she play for? So where do we start in this journey of winning with other people? How do we put ourselves in a position, a good position, to have a positive influence on behalf of Christ? Here's what I want to do this morning. I want to take a look at the life of one of the greatest kings in the history of Israel, in the history of the world, actually, King Solomon. I want you to, if you haven't already, grab a Bible, turn to 1 Kings chapter 3. We're going to be going, uh, beginning in verse 5, going through verse 14. Solomon began, I think, uh, where I would suggest we need to begin. He, he made it a point, he made it a point to acknowledge kindness, acknowledge kindness. This is what we read in verse 5 from uh, 1 Kings chapter 3. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon during the night in a dream, and God said, Ask for whatever you want me to give you. Solomon answered, You have shown great kindness to your servant, my father David, because he was faithful to you and righteous and upright in heart. You have continued this great kindness to him and have given him a son to sit on his throne this very day. Friends, how often do you simply take notice of the kindness of other people? Do you take the kindness or goodness of other people maybe for granted? Perhaps, perhaps some of us are people who kind of have this strong sense of a privilege that we don't need to acknowledge others being kind to us. Fortunately for King Solomon, when given an opportunity to ask for anything here in 1 Kings, he, first of all, he acknowledges 
the kindness of God. This kindness, Solomon tells us, is that God allowed the throne of David to continue in existence even after King David had died. You know, I've always maintained, my, and Ruthie can tell you this, I've always maintained that you can tell a lot about a person or about people based on two things. Number one, how they treat little kids. Hmm? But number two is how they treat wait staff at a restaurant. I remember once having lunch uh, with a group of people I was meeting for the very first time. I was ashamed, dismayed, and disappointed to watch this group of committed Christian people treat the hardworking but overextended staff at this restaurant with harshness that made me want to leave lunch, not have anything to do with the group. Not once did anyone in the group treat the staff with kindness or respect. Instead, they displayed impatience, disregard, even contempt for the waitress, causing me to come to the conclusion that just maybe these might not be people that I wanted to be associated with. And Solomon, see, Solomon didn't allow his position as king of Israel, the son of the greatest king of Israel, the one who was called a man after God's own heart. He didn't allow him being that guy's son to blind him to the importance of having a grateful, kind heart toward those who had showed him kindness. How about you? What I'm asking you this morning is to take a mirror, to look closely at yourself, kind of see maybe there's some changes that you need to make in the way that you deal with, the way that you relate to others. King Solomon shows us by his example the importance of acknowledging the kindness of others. But there's also another acknowledgement that we need to make. We also need to acknowledge our need. We need to acknowledge our need. Now, beginning in verse 7 of, verse, of chapter 5, we read these words. Now, O Lord my God, you have made your servant king in place of my father David. But I'm only a little child and do not know how to carry out my duties. Your servant is here among the people you have chosen, a great people, too numerous to count or number. So give your servant a discerning heart to govern your people and to distinguish between right and wrong. For who is able to govern this great people of yours? Solomon has just ascended to the throne of the nation of Israel. And if you read a little bit earlier in the book of 1 Kings, if you read over in 1 Chronicles, Solomon moves very quickly to strengthen uh, his throne and his nation. He reinforces his relationships with surrounding nation states. He, he marries the daughter of Pharaoh, which actually was the beginning of problems because if you read more about the life of Solomon, he kind of multiplied his marriages. But he did it because he wanted to make an alliance with Egypt. Solomon begins, make, Solomon begins making all of these right moves. His nation's status as a major player in the ancient world is a key. What's the first thing that Solomon admits to the Lord about himself as he kind of gazes in the mirror? He realizes he can't do what he's supposed to be doing alone. He needs help. He acknowledges that he has a need. I don't know if you've ever heard the name Tessica Brown. Anybody ever heard that name, Tessica Brown? Okay. Tessica Brown is internet famous because she made a pretty huge mistake. But she used that opportunity to do something good. Tessica Brown became famous after uploading a video to TikTok. Anybody here ever heard of TikTok? She uploaded a video to TikTok explaining how she accidentally set her hair with spray-on industrial adhesive. She used Gorilla Glue 
instead of her similarly named product called Got to Be Glued. Brown said it went from scary to terrifying to pretty much being tortured. The reactions to people hearing about the news online, they were all mixed. Some thought that it was an intentional prank, that she did it just so she could go viral. Others seemed to recognize it as an an innocent mistake that left her in genuine distress. Nevertheless, Brown was on a mission to redeem her hair from a sticky situation. She endured an unsuccessful trip to the hospital. Her friends set up a GoFundMe account to help pay for whatever treatment she could find. Redemption, however, finally came from a plastic surgeon uh, out in Los Angeles, of course. Dr. Michael Obing, who offered to operate on her free of charge. He had a chemistry background and he created a solvent to break down the adhesive's active ingredient, polyurethane. Brown said, Dr. Oben got every bit of it out. She received a few extra scalp treatments to make sure that her hair wouldn't fall out. And out of her gratitude, her gratitude for his generosity and his expertise, she donated the balance of that GoFundMe account to an organization called Restore. And Restore was started by Dr. Oben, his own foundation, and it raised money for overseas patients who needed reconstructive surgeries. Friends, there are times when we simply have to let others know we need them. We need help. We'll not achieve much of anything if we behave as if we we need no one, that no one has anything they can offer to us. You know, I have talked about this before, how much I just admire Michael Jordan. Michael Jordan, watching him play all those years, he's incredible. Just this morning, I watched another video of the guy take off from the half, from the, from the free throw line and dunk the ball. He started jumping from the free throw line. Then he dunked it. He achieved incredible celebrity status. He, he helped this small little company out in Oregon. I don't know if you've ever heard of them, but they were a nobody company. Uh, anybody ever heard of uh, Nike? He put, them on his, he put them on his back and they propelled that brand worldwide. And he set record after record after record. But you know the one thing Michael Jordan didn't do early on in his career? Anybody know? He didn't win what? He didn't win championships. He never won any championships. All those years, the NBA championship, it eluded him. And in his book, he wrote a book called I Can't Accept Not Trying. He said, we started winning championships when there was an understanding among all 12 players what our roles were. And let me tell you, he understood what his role was too. He understood that he couldn't do any of that without the other people around him. In other words, we knew we needed one another. We acknowledged that we couldn't do this without depending on one another. We had to acknowledge that need and live with it. How about you? Have you acknowledged your need for other people? If you really want to win with other people, you need to follow in the footsteps of King Solomon. You got to acknowledge, you got to acknowledge kindness. It's critical that you you acknowledge that you have needs. And finally, and probably I would say the most important thing that you need to do is you got to allow God to be God. Beginning in verse 10, 1 Kings chapter 5. This is what we read. The Lord was pleased that Solomon had asked for this. So God said to him, since you have asked for this, not for a long life or wealth for yourself, nor have you asked for the death of your enemies, but for discernment and administering justice, I will do what you have asked. 
So I will give you a wise and discerning heart so that there will never have been anyone like you, nor will there ever be. Moreover, I will give you what you have not asked for, both riches and honor, so that in your lifetime you will have no equal among kings. And if you walk in my ways and obey my statutes and commands, as David your father did, I will give you a long life. God looked at the attitude that Solomon displayed and completely blessed Solomon's socks off. How, just how crazy do you think it would have been for Solomon to get to this point after expressing gratefulness, admitting his own shortcomings, for him to say, okay, God, thanks, beat it, I don't need you anymore. But you know, how many of us, how many of us do that to the people around us? We, we get what we want from them, maybe, And we have maybe this ungrateful heart. We're unwilling to have this grateful heart. Perhaps we're unwilling to confess that we really need, we really need them in our lives. But we often get to the point where we need to let people do what they do best. Just like Solomon allowed God to be God and to do what he could do. Sometimes we find ourselves, we'll say, well, that's the last time I'll ever get to the point and the position where I count on anyone else to come through for me. You guys know what I'm talking about. Let's count on somebody that didn't do things like I wanted to. Our stubborn, self-reliant switch is moved to the on position. We put up a wall. We refuse to let others do what they do best. Our pride gets in the way. We try to do it all ourselves. And this is where the words of James chapter 4, verse 6, the words that James shares, he says this, but he gives more grace, talking about God. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And the scripture that James is actually quoting from, from uh, in, in that particular passage, James is actually quoting a scripture that comes from the book of Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 34. And it's really interesting that James is quoting Proverbs. Because you know who wrote Proverbs? King Solomon wrote Proverbs. He would know a thing or two about the importance of humility. Jim Cimbala is a pastor of Brooklyn Tabernacle in New York City. And he says this in a book called The Life That God Blesses. The Bible never says that God resists a drunkard or thief or even a murderer. But he does resist the proud. Don't allow your pride don't allow your pride to get in the way as you, you relate to other people around you. Don't let your pride keep you from letting others do what they do best. <laughs> Solomon, his life shows us what can happen when we do just these things. If you want to win with other people, you want to, you want to be attractive to other people, you want to grow strong relationships with other people. If you want to be an influencer for, for the sake of God, not just, you know, some, uh, for no reason. If you want to have an impact for Christ, you want to make a difference for Jesus, you have to let God accomplish what he wants first in your own life. You got to start with you. You want to win with other people? Start with what's going on with you. How many of you have heard the name? Luis Palau. Does anybody does that sound familiar? Luis Palau is an evangelist. He preached as part of the Billy Graham Association. Maybe you've never heard of Billy Graham. Billy Graham's an old-time preacher. Preach, uh, did uh, these giant conferences and across around the world. It's estimated that Billy Graham preached to billions. But Luis Palau was one of Billy Graham's preaching associates. And he shares this story. He says during his first semester at the Multnomah School of the Bible. It's a, it's a school out in, Ohio, in, in Oregon. There was a gentleman there by the name of Major Ian Thomas. He headed what was known as torchbearers. And he spoke at one of their chapels where Louis Palau was as a student. And he talked about how it took Moses 40 years in the wilderness to learn that he was nothing. Then one day Moses was confronted by a burning bush just a bunch of ugly sticks. Yet Moses 
had to take off his sandals. Why? Why did he take off his sandals? Because God was in the bush. Major Thomas said, God was telling Moses, I don't need a pretty bush or an educated bush or an eloquent bush. Any old bush will do as long as I'm in the bush. If I'm going to use you, it won't be you doing something for me, but me doing something through you. Louis Palau says, I was, I was that kind of bush, <laughs> a useless bunch of dried up sticks. I could do nothing for God. All my reading and studying and modeling myself after others was worthless unless God was in the bush. Only he could make something happen. When Major Thomas closed his message, Louis Palau says, I ran back to my room and in tears, I prayed in my native tongue, Spanish. My spiritual struggle was finally over. I'd let God be God and let Luis be dependent on him. Friends, we're beginning that time of year, that season of the year where school begins. We, we get back into old familiar rhythms, maybe not rhythms we're totally crazy about, these rhythms give us new opportunities. And I am convinced that one of the best opportunities you can take advantage of is determining how you can be the presence of Christ with other people. What does it take? What does it take? Well, we'll keep talking about that next week. What does it take to really win with people? You got to start with yourself. You've got to start with yourself.